Hi and welcome to this um, lecture um, on um, American Westward Expansion and what we're going to examine today are a whole range of um, different things, different um, categories that may explain the motivations for people going west um, and I want to kind of just very quickly point to um, these questions really just to differentiate between the two of them. The first question is why Americans went west and that will be the, the priority but a lot of the um, history of this particular topic focuses on um, why Americans were able to go west i.e. how did they go west um, and we are less interested um, in um, that part of the story but that is an inevitable um, part of the story you can't really um, examine why people went west without looking at how they actually how they actually got there um, and this is something that may come up when you look at the kind of wagon trails that went to Oregon or ships that made their way to California during the gold rush. Now part of the way that we will answer that first question, why did Americans go west, will involve us looking at different factors or categories that will, you know, kind of broad categories that will help us, help you make um, some type of sense as to what led um, those who lived in the east to give up their lives and then start afresh in the west. Now we could arguably add more factors here or we could kind of split some of these factors up but I've kind of kept things um, fairly simple. We will look at economic motivations for going west, ideological slash maybe cultural factors and then social factors so you know lifestyle, better way of, of, of living perhaps and um, a kind of more um, environmentally friendly west rather than the kind of urban polluted east. Now part of what I'm going to do today is really just kind of introduce you to what the west was and some of the debates about western history, uh, western, um, history and western historians. I'm not going to spend really that much time looking at examples that you could fit into these categories. That's really what you're going to do when you complete all of the My City activities and there's lots of My City activities but they are, they're all pretty straightforward. In fact, this topic, it's not an essay topic, it's a potential exam topic. Um, this one is, is useful because, um, or this method of teaching is useful because you actually can learn quite a lot from video on this topic because there's a fantastic um, documentary series called The West um, by Ken Burns. Uh, it's a kind of an American classic and I've been able to kind of give you extracts from this documentary in the My City um, online book. So what you can do is you watch all of these different um, examples of why people go west. You yourself can um, look at the little table that is at the, the very last page of the My City um, online book on Westward Expansion and you can start to think about where you would place some of these examples and events um, and motivations. Would you place them under economic, ideological or, or social? So I think videos is, is a useful, good way to learn about this, about this topic. Um, there will be some reason that you still have to do it as well, obviously. Now this might seem like a fairly um, obvious question, where is the West? It's in the West. But obviously during the period of the 18th and 19th century in particular, the West changes. So over the course of time, uh, what was the West is no longer the West. Sometimes that becomes, you know, the, the East or the Midwest. And then you get the kind of far west or what becomes known as the Pacific Coast of the United States. So you could argue that there are three frontiers if you like. The first one being the new frontier that opened up in this kind of territory here, the kind of orangey colour here where it says Ohio and some of these territories here, Illinois, Michigan, um, Indiana. These are the, the first frontier. This is where America frees itself from the British post um, American Revolution and the American government can start to think about farmers making their way to this part of um, the continent and President Thomas Jefferson um, in the very beginning of the 19th century is very keen um, on farmers settling in this area. The next frontier then is this very large segment of land known as the Louisiana Purchase which I'll talk about briefly later on. This um, becomes the West, I guess it might be called sometimes the Midwest. This is um, where there's lots of um, rather um, 
desirable farmland at this point in the United States. Lots of Native Americans resided in this um, location, however. Um, but when Jefferson settles this territory, or when Jefferson purchases this territory from Napoleon's France, it is not necessarily his intention to um, remove Native Americans. And then the final frontier, if you like, the third frontier, is um, the kind of lighter shade of orange, which is territory that is acquired from Spain. Much of this territory comes from the Spanish-American War, um, sorry, the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. Um, the large section down here in the south, which is Texas, that is brought into the United States um, a decade before this. Um, when Texas declares itself as independent and then um, is um, annexed to the United States. This is the kind of final frontier. Once this has been settled, then obviously America as a nation has reached the, the Pacific coast. <clears throat> and once it reaches the Pacific coast, um, there is nowhere else for um, settlers to go, at least not within what we now call mainland United States. So this is um, the West. Um, pretty much everything um, beyond the Ohio um, River. Um, what was the West? And this might seem like another slightly strange question to ask. Well, what was it? It was land, it was territory. But we want to think about what was the West in terms of what did it mean, what did it symbolise within the American psyche. And here we have got um, two or three different historians that I want to just touch on briefly who have um, expressed their views on the West. Now, the first historian really to tackle this question of what was the West was Frederick Jackson Turner who in 1893 delivers a paper to the um, American History Association and he calls this paper The Significance of the Frontier. Jackson looked at the 1890 census and it was clear to him from that census that the West had been settled or the frontier as he referred to it had been settled. America could not go further West. Now for Turner he believed that it was now the time for historians to really analyse and kind of almost appreciate the beauty of American um, Western settlement. Turner really was of the belief that Western America was real America. That Western America, this um, land that had been transformed by settlers, by pioneers, by businessmen, by um, mountain men and a whole um, range of Americans, ordinary Americans who decided to give up their life in the East to go West. He was of the view that in the process of this mass migration over the course of a century um, or so that a new American character, character, character developed and this character was the character of that rugged individual um, American, the American who looked after himself and his family. This for Turner and for many who um, agreed with Turner's interpretation was really the birth of true American democracy. Democracy out in the West, free from the federal government, eventually free from the corruption and all the problems that came with politics back in the East. This felt like a, a new start and proper Republican American democracy could be found um, in all parts of the West. Turner doesn't really talk about migrants in terms of why they go west. He does talk about the west offering up new opportunities. Is he referring to economic opportunities? Well I guess we can say that is the case. Most people when they migrate um, will do so for economic reasons. I accept that some people will migrate. We know about this from um, watching the news that of, often people are forced to migrate due to persecution and violence and war. There will be one example um, in particular, the example of Native Americans, who are pushed further and further west because of um, some form of persecution and to a lesser extent the Mormons go west for that reason. There may be an element of adventure as well. Turner really likes this idea of the um, American um, going west and having to deal with the problems of what life was like in the complete wilderness and having to kind of learn from Native Americans. So there is a kind of adventure element to what Turner is talking um, about as well. But more than anything else, Turner is talking about the West as being this setting of where the American character um, truly um, develops. And um, therefore a kind of romantic notion of the West um, develops um, during during this period. And as 
a romantic version of Western history is then replicated throughout the 20th century in movies and books and, and, and stories and whatnot. So that's, um, that's a traditional view. I should say that Turner's traditional view focuses mostly on the positive aspects of, of westward expansion. He, is, um, he, he doesn't really give much time or attention to slavery in the West or the um, extermination of Native Americans in the West or the exploitation of Mexicans in the West or the oppression of women who go West. All of that is, is left out of Turner's thesis. Here's why American patriots, American nationalists like this version of history. Now, for a long time, that was the dominant interpretation of westward um, um, expansion. And historians really didn't touch on it that often. During the 1930s, you get some progressive historians who maybe think about some of the um, economic uh, reasons for going west and you know big business starts to go west and takes advantage of uh, migrant workers who, who go there um, and a big part of that story is the building of the um, uh, Trans-Pacific Railway um, during and after the American Civil War but on the whole Turner's view is kind of left uh, Walter Prescott Webb adapts it slightly he focuses perhaps a bit more on utilisation of the west for economic reasons so he talks about um, Americans going west and um, exploiting, not necessarily people, but exploiting the environment so that um, people can make money from farmland and can make money from um, the rivers with the trading opportunities and, and so on. So we get a little bit of an update um, with Webb in the 30s and then again there's not really anything um, that comes from um, historians that is radically different until we get to the 1980s and we get a female historian, Patricia Nelson Limerick, who transforms the nature of American uh, Western history. And really what Limerick does is um, looks at the history of the West from a much more critical perspective. And what she achieves is the beginning of a new historiographical interpretation of the West. And this now is the kind of consensus view. Limerick is a real pioneer in, in historical terms. And um, I just want to very quickly um, quote this bit from Limerick. She says, the context for property and profit had been um, accompanied by a context for cultural dominance. So Americans did go west for economic reasons, but with it, they also take their culture with them and this air of superiority that comes with American Eastern culture. So even though there's a, a new type of American in the West, they bring with it their language, they come with their culture, they come with their religion. And with all of these elements of culture comes conquest. Limerick's book, fantastic um, book, written in 1987, is called The Legacy of Conquest. It's a very different image of the West that you get from reading Limerick than from Turner and then all of these kind of popular culture, popular culture interpretations of um, the, the Wild West. You will read the first chapter of Limerick's book because she just very cleverly introduces to you why we should explore westward expansion and western history from the perspective of um, conquest. So here is the summary of these two interpretations. The frontier historians, the historiographical view that dominates for close to 100 years argues that the frontier was settled by brave, adventurous, mostly men, intent improving their way of life, and if in the process inferior groups such as Native Americans got in the way, then so be it. Turner does talk about wars with Native Americans, but he doesn't seem to have any real um, issue with it. He refers to slavery as a mere incident, to quote him. So he turns the negatives into positives, basically by just ignoring the negatives. Whereas when Limerick comes along and then you get what we call the New Western historians, many of whom come from a kind of left-wing perspective, the term frontier is regarded as being racist almost, extremely nationalistic in its outlook. For, Turner, uh, for Limerick, Turner's view did not consider the West as a conquered land. For Limerick, there was an invasion of the West, almost suggests suggest an element of American imperialism or colonialism. 
when we study the Spanish-American War of 1898, historians have often regarded this, this period as the beginnings of American um, overseas expansion and imperialism. But America had already had, had you know, experience of, of colonialism and conquest and imperialism because that is what they've done within the, the North American continent. So Limerick's view is much less romantic, it's much more critical of America, of white America, um, and hence why it might not necessarily always be um, a history that was welcomed or is welcomed by certain sections of the American population. Now, one of the examples, in fact, we're only going to look at one example today and I'm going to leave the rest of the examples to yourself. But um, one of the examples that Patricia Nelson Limerick includes within her book, The Legacy of Con Conquest, in fact, she includes this story because it's such a, such a fascinating story in her very first chapter, is the story of Narcissa Prentice Whitman. And the story of Narcissa Whitman is interesting for a whole um, range of reasons. The first question to ask is, who was, um, who was Narcissa Whitman and why did she go west? Well, she was um, a woman living in, um, I guess you could say, the east um, um, of America. Um, she is um, living in Missouri, which is obviously kind of in the first frontier area of the west. And um, when she is, is, is here, she um, um, learns of a story that Native Americans are looking for their souls to be saved and the reason for this is because in 1831 um, some Nez Perce Native Americans make their way to um, St. Louis, Missouri and when they are there they, um, they tell the story, these Native Americans of the Nez Perce tell the story that they'd heard um, a long time ago that there would be men coming to the North American continent wearing black robes and carrying a special book that would bring salvation. Now, obviously, the story that this person picked up was the story of Christianity and maybe missionaries, priests, um, coming to um, America, as obviously it was the case, and um, preaching and converting um, Native Americans to um, a new way of life. And obviously, the story of Christianity was obviously made to sound so appealing these Native Americans who had suffered a whole range of um, kind of um, tragedies but most of these tragedies were not man-made these were kind of nature um, for a few years was pretty cruel on the Nez Perce Indians so they come looking for help and when they do so there is a, a, a Protestant guy named William Walker who writes about this experience of the Nez Perce and he writes a letter, and the letter is circulated um, to churches um, across across America, across the East. And one of the people um, in 1835 who um, who hears about this this letter, who hears about these Native Americans, is Narcissa Prentice, who will then become Narcissa Prentice Whitman. And she wants to go west to convert Native Americans into um, Christians. The problem is, where she ends up is not where the Nez Perce are, but where a different Native American tribe are called the Cayuse. So, leaving Missouri, this fairly well-established part of um, the United States, and Narcissa Prentice Whitman, who marries, and hence why she takes on um, the Whitman surname, she marries Marcus Whitman. Um, they make their way um, west. You can even see the Whitman Trail. These are the kind of smaller dotted um, lines. And um, they make their way here and then they kind of join on with some other um, passes and eventually make their way um, to um, the area that we now call Oregon. And it's here um, that they would um, that they would set up their mission. You can actually see here, 1836, the Whitman mission on the Walla Walla River. And Narcissa and her husband and a couple of friends that they go with, who uh, are also married, Henry and Eliza Spaulding, they, um, they go with, in their eyes, good intentions to convert Native Americans to um, Christianity. So, off um, 
off the go on these Sunday. Images that have often shown of the, the wagon trails of American pioneers moving west to improve their life, but also in this instance, improve the life of Native Americans. Um, I just want to um, talk a little bit more about um, their sister Whitman very quickly. Um, here are the Native American tribe who have had some um, kind of exposure to Catholicism because of French fur trappers who had um, done some work up in the Oregon country and they were aware of obviously whites in this part of the, the world, uh, some who came through British territory, British Columbia, uh, uh, which is modern day Canada, um, down into um, Oregon. So they weren't completely um, um, alien to white people, but what they hadn't really experienced in the Cayuse were whites coming to their land and settling. Fur traders would come and trade, would you know, shoot some beavers and then trade beaver pelts and move on, or trade in fish and move on, and the Cayuse were fine with that. But what about when missionaries land, and not just missionaries, but then you have this constant stream of migrant wagons coming every year, more migrants come, more migrants come. The Williamette Valley where the Whitman settled in Oregon was, um, or they settled close to it, they don't quite go as far as the Williamette Valley, but this location was deemed to be some of the most fertile land um, in North America. And the Cayuse have to um, basically uh, watch and sit and watch as all of these um, migrants come their way. So the mission is set up and the experiences of um, Narcissa and her relationship with the Cayuse are strained really from the, the beginning. Now, in your own time, I want you to watch this little video clip. It lasts about five minutes or so. And it shows you Narcissa Whitman um, and, and basically what happens to her and her, her family. It's a really tragic story, but the question that you may want to consider, and we'll look at this question in a moment in more detail, but is who is the victim in this story? Is it Narcissa? Is it the um, migrants? Or is it the Cayuse Indians? I just want to quote a little bit from um, Patricia uh, Nelson Limerick. And um, this is a little extract from page 38 where she talks about um, Narcissa Whitman. She says, um, and she kind of quotes um, Narcissa as well here. Um, Arrived in the Oregon country, the missionaries, like salesmen, um, divided up markets, they divided up the tribes and locations. The Whitmans set, the Whitmans set to work on the Cayuse Indians. Narcissa Whitman's life in, in Oregon, says um, Limerick, provides little support for the image of life in the West as free, adventurous and romantic. So everything that Turner spouted off about how fantastic the West was just does not resonate with what Narcissa Whitman experiences. Most of the time um, Narcissa laboured. She had one child of her own. She adopted many other children, mixed blood children of fur trappers who had just been kind of left to their own devices sometimes, and orphans from the overland um, trail. And she says, my health has been so poor, um, she wrote to her sister in 1846, and my family has increased so rapidly that it has been um, impossible. You will be astonished to know that we have 11 children in our family, and not one of them is our own by birth, but so it is. Seven orphans, says Narcissa, were brought to our door in October 1844, whose parents had both died on the way to settle in Oregon. You actually hear the story of the Seeger family um, as you watch um, some of the clips on My City, the section which looks at what we call Oregon fever. This is the desire to come to Oregon for a better way of life. Um, in that story, in that video clip, you'll hear of the Seeger family who have just problem after problem en route from the east to the west. And um, it doesn't end well because, because both parents die en route to the final location. What do you do with all these children who are then left orphaned in the middle of nowhere with any family relations or way back in East Well, To give Narcissa women credit, she, she took them in. Um, who else would look after um, these these kids? Um, so that, that's a little extract kind of gives you a, a little insight into just how difficult life was. And one of the stories that Patricia Limerick um, really likes to tell is how women are oppressed within the, the, the West. They do um, all the same menial labour that they carried out uh, in the East. Um, they have um, 
very few friends and family out in the West and they have all of the childcare um, and education sometimes to, to kind of deal with. Um, although this is a, a different story, the first chapter of, of, of um, Limerick's book also talks about the prostitute in the West, which was another really depressing story, but a good example of how women were exploited in the West. Prostitutes are clearly victims of westward expansion. Who exploits them? Obviously, men. And the men who use them are often exploited themselves. So if it's working class miners, let's say in San Francisco, who um, exploit these prostitutes, then um, these men themselves feel that they have been exploited by mine owners. Um, and the kind of, um, the kind of cycle of exploitation um, goes down and goes down. So the real victims, I guess, of the West are, and not really a surprise, they are Native Americans, they are um, oppressed um, women, sometimes they are slaves, sometimes they are working class, often they are, they are Mexicans or former Mexicans. Um, Narcissa Whitman does have her own child at one point, but the tragedy continues when her only child um, drowned um, at the age of two. So the West is really, I think to quote um, um, Limerick, the West is really testing um, Narcissa Whitman's faith. Um, now, things get worse uh, for Narcissa because um, Source One, which is available in my city, um, kind of gives us this little insight into Narcissa's life in the West and then concludes with the story that she is um, that she's murdered, she's killed by these um, Cayuse Indians. The Indians resent the migrants who are coming to the, the West, they resent Narcissa Whitman and the way that Narcissa and her husband Marcus um, treat the Native Americans. So although they are there as missionaries to try and convert, Narcissa has a really real kind of racist um, attitude towards the, the Cayuse. She thinks that they are lazy and she thinks that they smell and she doesn't really like having them um, anywhere near her house and when measles take hold it comes from when the migrant kind of uh, wagons that, that come along the trail when measles take hold and kills the native americans and um, children because they have no resistance to this disease the cayuse have just basically had enough of these um, white people coming and telling them how to live their life and we therefore get a massacre of the um, the Whitman um, mission. Not all are, are murdered, but um, in uh, November 1847, um, Marcus Whitman is first killed by a tomahawk, and then uh, the massacre um, continues, um, and I think um, there are um, 14 people um, murdered by the, the Native Americans. Most of these Cayuse then hand themselves in um, to um, a sheriff in the area, um, and some of these men are, are executed as a, as a result. The cultural differences between um, Narcissa and the Native Americans was just too much to overcome. Who are the victims in this story? Is Narcissa and her husband and her adopted family, are they the victims because they are murdered? The question that maybe you might want to ask is, should they have been there in the first place? Did the Cayuse want them there in the first place? Should the Cayuse have been delighted to have had so-called civilised parts of um, the, the United States come to their land to try and improve their way of life. Well, the Cayuse obviously did not want to be um, civilised, in inverted commas, in the way that Americans would like them to be. And they definitely, definitely did not really want or didn't care much with the idea of being Christianised um, either. So, this um, story is multi-layered because this is the Whitman as a victim, many of the migrants who go west and don't quite make the success they would like, you could argue are victims, but if you had a hierarchy of victims, you might argue that Native Americans are more likely to be victimised than, than anybody else within this um, story. Um, so the Cayuse um, and the, the Whitmans, um, these, this story by Limerick is a really useful way into trying to get your head around this um, westward um, history. Um, uh, I should say, I should say, um, where, where would you place the story of the Whitmans in a kind of category of economic, ideological, social? I think most likely you would place it in a kind of ideological, cultural, because the Whitmans go west for religious reasons, um, hence ideological. One final point um, before I um, conclude this lecture. Um, the term manifest destiny is, is often 
um, referred to. And what it really just means is that as Americans went west, they often believed that it was their God-given right to go west, that they had been um, destined by um, providence to um, take their ideas, their version of government, their religion, and move west. You can see in this famous um, painting from 1872 by John Gast, you can see that the light from the east is slowly pushing the darkness from the west away. And you see the progress of boats and of steam trains and of carriages and wagons and hard-working pioneers who are setting up farms down in the bottom right-hand corner. And they are pushing away with this kind of vision, if you like, of um, American purity um, holding the Bible in the centre of the, the, the picture. They are pushing away the darkness and the Native Americans who are part of the, the darkness. This is, in hindsight, um, obviously a slightly um, or an incredibly um, optimistic, um, idealistic version of American history. But it's, it's quite accurate in some respects. This is what does happen to Native Americans. Americans truly believe that this was good, this was for the benefit of all, and that Native Americans should assimilate and take on um, kind of Western habits, Western practices. I say that up until a point racism still existed and Native Americans were still regarded as being racially inferior. So plenty of white Americans didn't trust them and were happy to engage in conflict uh, with them. Okay, um, I want to just touch on one final um, example today. It's not really an example, it's just the adding of that large piece of land that I mentioned at the start, the Louisiana Purchase Territory. And um, the reason I want to just focus on this briefly is because it doesn't really fit into any category in the way that the subsequent examples you'll look at do. Um, it's worth noting that um, Louisiana Purchase, purchased by President Jefferson with the intention of expanding America further west, um, was not, Jefferson was not somebody who really believed in imperialism or conquest. In fact, those terms imperialism didn't really mean that much to, to Jefferson, even though he knew what colonialism was because he played his part in kicking the British out. But um, Jefferson really just was, uh, as a kind of enlightenment figure, wanted to know what the West was like. And let's um, be clear on this, a lot of Americans had no idea what life was like in the West, what type of um, plants grew there, what um, food could grow there. There was not really that much knowledge about the Native American tribes in the West. Um, Jefferson hoped to find a, a waterway, a water passage that would take Americans from the East straight through the Pacific. It doesn't exist, right? It shows you therefore how little um, Americans knew about this um, vast tract of land. So when Jefferson buys the Louisiana Territory from the French, and um, when he sends um, Lewis and Clark, these um, kind of guys that go on this expedition to document what life was like in the, the West, as well as try to find this mysterious Northwest Passage, um, this river outlet to the Pacific, um, he's really sending these people out with a kind of scientific um, sense of um, duty. Um, Jefferson's not thinking about, you know, removing Native Americans at this point. He's not really thinking about um, anything um, that you could say uh, is imperialistic in outlook. Um, but I think it's important to just introduce this um, this first um, example because Jefferson's got a genuine interest of what life is like beyond the, the kind of um, first um, frontier. He does believe that maybe there can be some trading opportunities that may come from Americans eventually, eventually settling this um, area. Okay, that is all for now because the other examples that you're going to look at, I mean you can look at them via the Sway presentation, but you're going to get much more from examining these additional examples um, by looking at the um, video clips that are on my side. Okay, thank you.